You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I'm going to kick off the show with a quick shout out to the Gian boys. Uh, yeah, because yeah. We, we had that show where I talked about my love for Ozzy and how I'd like to give him the team and how I'd like to be the fly on the wall in the Guillen household when they actually honestly discuss what's going on with this White Sox team and what Dad would do if he had the team. And I don't think anything could be clearer than them retweeting the episode stating, you need to come over and hang out at Sox in the Basement. Always a good show. Thanks for the at Ozzy Guillen comments. They tagged Dad in it as well. And I think uh, I think I, I think I hit the nail on the head on that show. Yeah, that I, uh, that sounds like <laughs> that sounds like an invitation to be a fly on the wall at yeah, the very yeah, least. I, I, that'd be awesome. I mean, uh, I'd come that'd over. be amazing. I don't know oh if they gosh. want me to hang out on their podcast or come over for Sunday dinner. I'm up for both. All right, uh, absolutely. Just, whatever, whatever you, they say. You guys, let me know. I just want to. I just want to hear it. We don't even have to have microphones around. Just tell me what. Tell me what you really think, because I. I, I'm telling you, there's something there with that. And, you know, I, I'm sure the conversation hasn't changed because of the turnaround of nine out of their last 16. Because that's, you know, I, I get it. If you are a beat reporter and you've been following this train wreck rolled into a dumpster fire that is the Chicago White Sox 2024 season, I get how going nine and seven would get you excited. I don't fault you for it at all. Scott Merkin's been on this show so many times I can't even count him, and he's talking about the turnaround with Pedro in an article recently. I don't know if I would call it one, but I understand why the guys embedded are excited because it's been actually watchable for the last couple of weeks. But 9-7 and seven is a bad bounce away from being 500, and I think a better manager, like the one I described should be managing the team on the last episode would have them a lot better than 9-7 and seven over the last 16. And that's going into the doubleheader because we're recording before the two games on Tuesday were played. So, I mean, that number may be slightly different one way or another, but I still think they're a better team if your manager could recognize that Andrew Vaughn and Andrew Benintendi are not hitters to be placed in the top five of your lineup on a consistent basis. Yeah, And, and, yeah. and, and if that wasn't being done, if there was actual accountability – Forget nine and six. I'm sorry, nine and seven over the last 16 games. Forget that. You are instead 11 and five. You may be 12 and four. You may be, you may be still well below 500 and not winning anything this year, but the run itself would have been bigger through these last couple of series for certain because there's been plenty of mistakes and plenty of mismanagement going on. That has probably kept them down to only nine and seven when they could have actually had a bigger run up until this point. Well, and and honestly, a broken clock is right twice a day anyway, right? So it's not give a thousand monkeys a thousand typewriters and they can come up with a lineup better than Pedro's. I, something like that. Yeah. I don't know that they need <laughs> typewriters for that. They might just need baseball cards, but <laughs> or or they'll write Shakespeare and Pedro's sonnet will not be a happy one. But it, it's one of those things where the nine and seven quote unquote turnaround is just, you went from being like hopeless and unenergetic and just a a team that was impossible to watch because nothing good was coming out on the field from anybody to at least a team that seemed to have some life behind it. That seemed to have some hustle, some desire, some of the things that we talked about going into the season that we, we thought were going to be the hallmarks of a white Sox franchise. And really it has nothing to do with Pedro it has everything to do with Tommy Pham showing up, for, for starters. And and I think you get some blood into the locker room that actually cares. Because if you read about Brian Ramos, for example, this is a guy who said that, you know, however long he's in the major leagues, he's going to be learning something new about how to play defense and how to play this game. And he's never going to stop. And he's, you know, he's, he's worked really hard to learn English, for example, being a guy from Cuba. And... You get somebody in there like that who who has that attitude, and I'm not saying that other guys on the team don't, but when somebody comes up, performs, has that attitude as a rookie who is both humble and hungry, as he's described, you have 
inspiration for the other players on the team to sit there and go, well, wait a minute here. If Brian's doing it, I got to do it too. Tommy Pham comes in and he's in the business of Tommy Pham and is going to try and do everything he can to make Tommy Pham look good. And I don't think he speaks in the third person about himself as much as I do. But when when you got Tommy Pham trying to show up and, and show hustle and show that he is still a winning player, that does rub off on the other players as well too. And when you walked into this season – with some guys who felt like they were made men and didn't have to worry about it. Some guys like Dominic Fletcher who are anointed far too early in their careers to be, you know, to be comfortable with what's going on. And then when you have some guys that are are just trying to figure out what they are still at this point in their career, a guy like Andrew Vaughn, who's got to be sitting there questioning, what am I? Because I know what he is. Can I tell him what he is? He's not good. But, He's not going to be good. He's not a top three hitter in a lineup on any other team in Major League Baseball except for this one. Okay, for but, some reason. But you saying that as a fan and as an observer is one thing. If a baseball player says that to himself, then give it up and go sell cars. Right? So, so Andrew Vaughn's got to be sitting there questioning why am I not a top three guy? Why am I not the guy that I'm supposed to be? And I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's, it's playing with his head. Cause you do see him do things like, you know, th- that Ramos play that, that, that kind of is going to be a highlight from this year of, uh, you know, the throw from, from deep and foul territory where he bounces it. And then there's Vaughn just absolutely splayed out catching it. Right. And it's, it's a nice play for a first baseman. I don't care who you are. Uh, it, Something like that, you know, you see that, you sit there and go, okay, well, Andrew Vaughn's at least, th- there's clearly some effort and some hustle there because he could have just stood there and watched that ball go past him or tried to catch it and, and, you know, let the guy be safe. But I expect that Andrew Vaughn is sitting there questioning what is wrong with him. I expect well, that. Well, I'll give him an answer. I'll give him a legitimate answer what's wrong with him. It's not his effort, and it's not the fact that he could play defense, and he isn't, uh, he wouldn't be as bad of a ball player. The biggest thing that has, that has hurt Andrew Vaughn is the Chicago White Sox have hurt Andrew Vaughn. Well, yeah. The Chicago White Sox have told Andrew Vaughn that he's something that he's not way too early before they knew if he was that. The the Chicago White Sox are forcing him into a position where he must perform up at the top of an order when he's not equipped to do it and refusing to drop him down. For the same reason that the Chicago White Sox did Tim Anderson no favors last year, by continuing to trot him out there at the top of the lineup when he was ill-equipped to do it. And you know what happened? He went to another team that wasn't blinded by what they thought he was or could be and instead looked at what he actually was. And Tim Anderson started off the year for the Marlins at the bottom of the order. And guess what? He's still not that good. No. Whatever it was that he had, it, it, it isn't there anymore. And I don't know if he'll ever get it back. But that team can look at him and make a decision based upon his numbers, what they see, and everything. And the White Sox are blinded. And and, and you know, uh, yeah, you know, I, Chris Getz is about to do something that I hoped was gone when Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams walked out the door. Chris Getz is about to blindly stick with a certain player because that player was part of a trade. Remember. Rick and Kenny would do that all the time. We drafted this guy. We traded for this guy. So even though he's not the best guy for the job, he's going to stick around. Danny Mendick getting better and is going to be back on this team soon. Brian Ramos should remain at third base. And Danny oh, Mendick absolutely. should be playing second base. And Braden Shoemake or Nicky Lopez should be gone. One of them should be gone. All you did was trade away an up-and-down, inconsistent relief pitcher an Aaron Bummer that you didn't need anymore for five low-end scratch-off lottery tickets to see if any of them would turn into something. Would Mike Soroka get better and return to the form that he had before? No, no, he did not do that. In fact, over about the same amount of innings pitches he had last year when he was bad, he's got the same thing. An ERA north of six and a half, a fifth that's about the same, a whip over one and a half, and he's just not a very good pitcher. I was hopeful for him. You heard me talking about it all preseason once they made the move. I thought it was a steal. Turns out the Braves knew their players, and that's why he and the other four guys were not going to be on the 40-man roster when it was all said and done, and that's why they were willing to give up a bunch of players for a relief pitcher because none of them were going to make the Atlanta Braves roster. And guess what? You don't lose anything if a couple of them get dropped off the roster now. And you know what the White Sox are going to do? I know what they're going to do. I've watched this team too many times. They're going to take the young guy who's one of the first prospects we brought up and actually was performing when brought up 
and they're going to send him back down to keep Mendick around and to not have to make a move on Shoemaker and Lopez. I predict it right now. It's going to be it's going to be meet the new boss, same as the old boss, can't get out of their own way. If someone in your life needs to switch to a new age of life, contact Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, your great aunt or uncle out of assisted living. Make it so that they can get around on their own and live independently where they want to. Stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling. Hyatt Home Medical Equipment works with insurance and have 0% financing for qualified individuals. CPAP machines, unhappy with your vendor? Switch and get supplies directly mailed to you. Plus, test it all out at their showroom. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors, and you can learn all about them and more at hhme.com. And you know what? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's not exclusive to the White Sox. It really isn't. I was flipping through Twitter earlier, and I was I was watching a quote from Derek Shelton over at the Pirates. And they won't put Connor Joe in the lineup, even though statistically he's one of the best hitters on the team. They won't put him in regularly because they gave Rowdy Telez $3.5 million and he sucks. So every team does it. I just hope that Getz wouldn't do it. And for guys that are making this little and you gave up that little to get them, it's time to say, Braden Shoemake, thank you, but no thank you. Nicky Lopez, thank you, but no thank you. Somebody's got to go. It shouldn't be Ramos. Head, heading back down. Ramos should not be heading back down to the minor leagues. One of those guys, it's time for them to move on. Well, and you would presume that they would move on from Braden Shoemake, who was he's he's on this team in the capacity of a backup middle infielder, but he's not a starting caliber guy, and he wasn't necessarily going to be a star, starting caliber guy. I was a little shocked that he made the, the roster. I thought he really only made it because of his base stealing ability. No, he was predestined to, remember? We all thought that there was no way that he was going to make the roster, and then he was injured, and the moment the injury came back, Pedro was like, well, you know, we got to get this guy up to snuff so he'll right. be ready for the start of the season. He was predestined to because he was part of that deal. Instead of looking at the deal as we're going to add five bodies, and we're going to see who can actually make the team in spring training because we didn't give up that much in Aaron Bummer to get these five body so if we end up with two pieces and the other three are let go we still have a net gain they're determined that all five of them work out it's crazy well and we don't even know what the other guy is doing i I haven't paid attention to the minor leagues to see what that guy's up to but but the point i was trying to make is is that shoemake his only value if you were going to even put value on him and i don't care about predetermination or predestination or anything like that um frankly if a truck full of logs is going to hit somebody in the face i'm okay with it with this team but Braden shoemake was a base stealing threat and that was that was the one thing you could sit there and point to was from a backup middle infielder standpoint he can play all the infield positions very well defensively you would think and he can steal bases he does have five steals on the year that's pretty good but you can move on from him very easily because he's also not a prospect necessarily the same way that Zach Remillard is not a prospect the same way that Romy Gonzalez was not a prospect he, he just sort of fits that bill and Nicky Lopez can go away too and I know that he's a local guy I know he's going to do a, a charity softball thing and all that stuff and if you want to hold on to Nicky Lopez for for whatever reason that's fine but you're right not at the expense of Brian Ramos establishing himself as the third baseman of now in the future for this team because you need to start establishing some bodies that are going to be here next year and the idea that you're not going to do that and that you're going to continue to even and we all hear the rumblings about a rebuild and trading away well part of a rebuild is still establishing what happens next right that's a big part of a rebuild if that's what this is so Braden Shoemaker has been established as a guy who, at best, is a backup, is a bench player, is a piece that you that you have on the roster that fulfills a couple of different niches, and so he's replaceable. Same thing with Nicky Lopez. He's not a starting second baseman, and, and the idea of going forward for right now with a starting infield of Ramos at third, Paul DeYoung at short, Danny Mendick at second, and... Uh, I would prefer to see more Gavin Sheets at first than Andrew Vaughn from a hitting that's what, standpoint. That's what, that, that's what should be but there. That's, that's what, what should, should be there. there. Fam should be out in the outfield all the time. You, you, you should have I mean, Fam. You're, you sh- you're stuck with Ben Benintendi out there because you just don't have enough bodies to stick out in the outfield. Corey Lee should always be 
behind home plate. I mean, it's it, this is not hard to figure out no. who are the guys that should be playing. It's only hard for Pedro and Chris Getz. They're the only guys that can't seem to figure out who's actually earned a spot and earned playing time on this team. It is so frustrating. You know, it takes me back. I was thinking about this the other day because we went to the ball game. We we went over to Cork and Carey at the park. We had a, we had a wonderful time. Uh, we actually went there afterwards. We brought my daughter, who just uh, is graduating this week from Mother Macaulay. Congrats to Audrey. On her way to the University of Illinois to uh, be an architect. Uh, very excited about that. Her and her friend, we took them with us. Uh, we, we hung out in the Huntington Club uh, before the game. That, that, that uh, whatever that is, that, that the restaurant where you pay a cover charge for so you can go in and spend more money on your food. I can't figure out what the value is of it, but we went there. Yeah, we, it we was did. Nice. We did go there. <laughs> you know, we tried the campfire milkshake. Nobody liked it. <laughs> the whole it's, table. I mean, it's, it's nobody liked it. It's not nobody liked it. It's not my not, daughter who loves sweets was like, it's like chocolate milk with like a marshmallow on top. Of it. It, like, it's not <laughs> terrible. It's not the worst. It's, it's not, not like it's, it's actually awful. $15. It is not a $15 shake. In, no, in no way. And let me ask you a question. How many drunks? think that they can chew the top of the glass because it looks like pure chocolate yeah right how many times has somebody gotten hammered late in the game and bit through the top of that plastic glass i want statistics yeah i I do too i want to know how many people have walked away (laughs) with bloody tongues exactly but anyway we did that we saw the game right we stopped by the 108 saw those guys there uh kind of moved around the ballpark had a great time had really good seats right behind home plate. You you got those. Got to see Corey Lee and Paul DeYoung go back to back. Yes, that was good. that's my catcher. Okay, he should be playing all the time. Went afterwards over the cork and carry at the park. Okay, lively atmosphere. Great night. I always say it's like family beforehand. Get them fed and everything. Afterwards, kind of a party. But I, I was good bringing over, you know, my my daughter and her friend. We hung out outside while you and I had a, a libation before we, we headed out. And just kind of hung out and talked about the game. It's always a lively atmosphere over there at 33rd in Princeton. But one of the things that hit me while we were there, especially when we were sitting with the 108 guys, was Daniel Polka. Remember Daniel Polka? Why did Daniel Polka hit you? And and I didn't. He hit. I me. didn't even see him no, there. I didn't me. see him there. Like, what? Did he punch you in the face? I didn't see him did he hit either. you in the stomach? No, no. But just because of like we, where we were sitting oh, okay. out there. Okay, we're we're out in the right field by the corner. Okay, and we're out with the 108 guys who always loved them and talked about them and stuff like that. And it struck me. Remember in the last rebuild, not the first rebuild, but the second rebuild, which really wasn't a rebuild before this rebuild, which we're not exactly sure what kind of rebuild it is, but we'll just call that period the second rebuild. Remember during that one when Daniel Polka was actually a fun player to watch? Yes. He would hit home runs and he would capture your imagination and he would have moments where you'd be like, I love this guy. But when that was going on, did you ever think that Daniel Polka was actually going to be part of? of the nine men that would take the field when that team was fully formed? No, 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 you never thought that when he moved on, you're like, he was fun to have around. Right. And even fans who loved what he was doing on the field, who bought jerseys, who contacted him on social media. I remember he wore a socks in the basement hat while he went on the, uh, the corporate podcast on television. I loved it. And then he that. ended up on the okay. place. Right. But, but here's the thing. None of us really believed he was one of the pieces. You just enjoyed him, right? You have guys on this team right now stealing at bats they shouldn't be getting and games they shouldn't be playing who aren't even as good as him, who have no part in what the finished product should be, could be, or would be. And that's what I don't understand. That's the thing. After I, If I could sit back and I can look at Daniel Polka. And I could say that was a guy I enjoyed watching, but I knew deep down that he was not a player that would be starting on my team if I ever wanted to be competitive, but I enjoyed having him around. And I'm able to recognize that with him, even during all the good times that he was having there. How can you, how can you look at this mess and justify to me why Nicky Lopez is automatically the second baseman all the time and we can't make any moves, or Braden Shoemake has to be on the team, or Martin Maldonado has to get half of the games to Corey Lee, like, or, or that Mike Soroka even. I know they're waiting for him to have three games in a row that are good so they can trade him for a bag of balls, but not everybody's going to be tradable at the deadline. You don't have him signed for next year. He didn't cost you anything. He doesn't cost you anything. Now, you don't have a guy down there right now that you don't want to bring up and start getting major league experience? That could be a part of the future for you. 
Like that's that's the stuff I don't get. In the middle of the of the glowing nine and seven run that will define a season and and give us all hope for the future, whatever garbage is being pushed at us this week. My my question, my legitimate question is, why do we continue to hang on to guys that cost us nothing to acquire, cost us nothing to get rid of, and don't have anything to do with the future of this team? And why are we going to let those guys continue to hang around and get meaningful at bats or meaningful starts high up in the rotation when they're batting over guys that actually may be part of it? I don't get it, Ed. Well, and to your point about Nicky Lopez, that's true of Nicky Lopez. He's a veteran. That's true of Martin Maldonado. He's a veteran. These guys are what they are at this point. There's very little hope that Nicky Lopez is going to suddenly – wake up tomorrow and be a 300 hitter and a top of the order guy. I mean, he's his his usefulness is as a utility infielder on a team. And Braden Shumake, I, look, I I would I would not argue the eyeball test has suggested that Braden Shumake is not a major league player. I would say though that giving this guy a chance as a rookie and he is a rookie it does make some semblance of sense in what you're saying, okay? Of of let's exhaust whether or not this guy really is something. However, it's been two months. He hasn't really shown anything. He hasn't shown enough. So maybe it's time to give somebody else an opportunity. But I, that's as far as I'm willing to let something like that go is Shoemaker as a rookie, maybe you give him a little bit of a longer leash than what he's gotten, or maybe you do give him a run of playing time or something like that. But Pick one. But he's, Pick which one you value more long-term and let the other right, one go. At some point you have to sit there and say, but what's the end game with this guy? And, and if you're going to give him a chance to play every day, then give him a chance to play every day for a while. And make him the second baseman. Let Paul DeYoung play short. Let Nicky Lopez platoon with him if that's what you want to do. But Nicky Lopez doesn't need to be in the in the in the lineup every single day. And frankly, nobody, none of the fans care that Nicky Lopez is from the Chicago area. All right, he's from Naperville. First of all, okay. A lot of no offense to you, Naperville people, but a lot of the rest of us don't even like to recognize you're part of this. Whole and thing. that's where I'm I was sorry. going with that. Is is that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not like it's not like he grew up. I had a cousin from Naperville who was a real ass, and so I I make fun of Naperville. I, I, no, sorry. that's okay. I, <laughs> the only people who don't make fun of Naperville are people who are from Naperville, and they're not very self aware. So I'll just say that <laughs> we just lost all of our Naperville listeners. Both of them, yeah. Um, they're all Cubs fans. They're, they're all Cubs fans. There anyway. What are we worried that's about? Probably yeah, I, that, that is I, probably I know where true. Naperville is. It's it's all Cubs fans. <laughs> Look, here's the deal, okay? And and, the, and any Sox fans that live in Naperville are probably transplants to Naperville, so we're okay. Right. They're like, you know what? You're right, they know. You, you got us. You pegged us. You look, pegged us. Look, if you move you into us. Naperville, you know. But but look, Nicky Lopez is not – it's not like he's connected with the fans on such an earthy level where we're sitting there going like, he's from Bridgeport, right? He's from Beverly. Right. He's – you know, he's a he's a local guy. He, you know, this is, this is what he was. I mean – it, 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 even if he was, we still are kind of looking at him like he's still just kind of Larry Garcia 2.0. I mean, it, it, maybe without the, the playoff heroics. But but figure this out. I mean, Corey Lee, yeah, Corey Lee is going to need days off. No catcher sits there and catches every single game. Martin Maldonado is as good as anybody else to sit there and give the guy a day off here and there. But it should be like when A.J. Persinski was the starting catcher, and then on Sundays, Ozzie Guillen would give him the day off and would put insert backup catcher here. Remember, Chris Widger was the backup on the 2005 White Sox. Chris Widger was playing in softball games the year before. He wasn't even in the major leagues. So oh, 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 it didn't oh, matter. Look, look, something happened, Ed. What happened? Something happened as we're talking. By the time people are listening to this, they're like, why are you yelling about Mike Soroka, Chris? That's already been taken care of. He is out of the rotation. Right here as we're recording. It is being reported that the White Sox are moving Michael Soroka out of the rotation into the bullpen. He will be replaced not by one of the young, promising guys down in the minors, no. but by Brad Keller. <laughs> uh, okay. I, oh God, even that. I'll give Brad Keller. This is my honest, this is my honest reaction to, to reading uh, it as we're sitting here talking. This is my honest reaction. It's just I'm laughing. I'm laughing at how stupid it is. How bad we are. Because what are they doing? They're admitting that Soroka's no good. He's only on a one-year deal. He doesn't have any trade value if you've moved him into the bullpen. Why are you keeping him around? 
But you don't want to admit that the, you made a trade and not everybody worked out in the trade. So you're going to keep him around. You're going to have him work in the bullpen. And you're going to take a former Kansas City Royal who is never good enough to be somebody on a competitive team. And you're going to move him into the rotation. And meanwhile, you got guys down there like Cannon and Nestrini who probably should get another good, get another look. Get a longer look than they got two games and we found something wrong with them in game two. So we're going to move them down. Okay? Because we never really wanted them up here anyway. And 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 that's that's the way that they run this team. It, do, it doesn't make it it doesn't make any sense. I think it, it insults my baseball sensibilities to watch what they're doing. If Mike Soroka is not good enough to be in your rotation, which you just said, and he has to be moved into the bullpen, and you only have control of him through the end of the year, and he cost basically nothing. Why does he remain? On the roster, he's never going to net you anything in a trade. He gives you absolutely no value. You're trying to say you have nothing. You have nothing. You're trying to tell me you have all these pitchers that are right there on the cusp of getting here, but none of them are good enough to move into the rotation now that Mike Soroka isn't around, and nobody's good enough to take over that spot, so he's going to remain in the bullpen. That's a joke, That's man. That's where the joke is. That's where the joke The fact that Soroka is just not being released at this point – and look, I, right. I get it. it it's a great story with him coming back from all the injuries and everything like that and being able to even pitch into the major leagues. Hell of an accomplishment for, for that guy. And, and, and I would personally, if the White Sox let him go, I would be, pro- I'd be the first one to say, not you know good riddance, but good luck, man. I hope, you, I hope you figure this out. I hope you catch on. I hope you can follow Eric Fetty's path. Maybe go over to Korea, reinvent yourself, and come back and have success. That would be great for Mike Soroka. I'm still a Mike Soroka fan. I'm, you know, I'm pulling for the guy because that's a, that's a tough run that he's been on. But from a business standpoint, Mike Soroka should just be let free. And and it doesn't make any it sense. It doesn't make any it's sense. It's a sunk cost. Yeah, it's a sunk cost, and it didn't cost you very much. Uh, unless what is he going to give you in the bullpen that you don't have? Because what you're telling me is you're telling me you have nothing. You keep lauding the system. You have nothing. You have nobody capable of coming up and giving you long relief innings if you really believe Keller's better than all of them as starters. And you don't have anybody available to come up and be a fifth starter better than Brad Keller. I will say this. I, I will. I would give them the benefit of the doubt on Brad Keller because we've seen how Chris Flexen has built up some interest in trade value. And, and when I talked about Chris Flexen as being a, a very tradable piece if he continues to pitch decently because he can move from the bullpen to the starting rotation – if, if you want to give Brad Keller that type of opportunity to show that he can still be viable as a starter as well as, and he's pitched well out of the bullpen to this point, and pitched well out of the bullpen, you can turn Brad Keller into something. So I'm okay from a standpoint of let's try and build Brad Keller's value because he's not part of the future and he's not a guy that we're sitting there going, well, Brad Keller, you know, this this could be something. No, Brad, we know what Brad Keller is. Everybody knows what Brad Keller is. Even Brad Keller knows what Brad Keller is. But if he's a guy that you could turn into a piece that gets moved at the deadline or before the deadline to a team that becomes pitching starved that could use a swing guy, that could use a guy that's going to fill in as a fifth starter, that could be another Chris Flexen opportunity because trading one Chris Flexen is great. If you can trade two and make something off of it, that's even better. So I'm, I'm willing to give him the, the Brad Keller to the All rotation. Right, I'll buy that. I'll fi- fine, I'll buy that. I'll buy that there, you might be able to find value in him and be able to move him like a Flexen, but then I still don't understand that, that your best option is to just keep Soroka around in, in the pen. I mean, I, I guess it just smacks to me of, again, it goes back to what I started the show with. I, I When I started the show, before, right here in real time as we're recording it, okay, when I started the show and I said I'm waiting for the White Sox to show me that they're basically the same as they always were because the last regime could never admit a mistake on a trade, could never admit a mistake in a draft, could never admit that they had misvalued somebody or pumped them up more than they needed to. And here we have one out of five pieces that were exchanged for Aaron Bummer, and he didn't work out. And look at the reluctance to move on from him. And it's the same reason why I think that when Mendick returns to the team, they won't do the right thing and move on from one of the other two pieces of that trade, which are Lopez and Shoemake. Okay, look, I if you lose Aaron Bummer for nothing, I still don't hate the trade. Maybe that's what Chris Getz needs to hear. He needs to hear from a passionate fan that it's not his fault if none of those guys work out. It's not your fault. 
You took a chance. You took a legitimate chance yeah. on a couple of pieces that might turn into something. If they don't work out, though, the trade becomes bad when you refuse to look at the players and say, there's a reason why the Braves gave me five for one. It was your first trade you ever made. Did you really think you were going to win the trade? You win. That's like somebody coming into my fantasy baseball league and trying to figure out why the rest of us keep fleecing them at the end of the year. Because you're new, kid. And you don't really know what you're doing yet. And that's why we win. And it takes you a couple years to figure it out. Well, and, and look, getting rid of Aaron Bummer was a good move no matter what you got back. But you have some pieces. Getting him back, if you just traded Aaron Bummer for Jared Schuster, that's already a win for the White Sox. That's, that's already a win. That's already a win. If nobody else works out and it's Bummer for Schuster, I'll take it. And if it's Bummer for the guy that's in the minors whose name escapes me because he's in the minors. Right. And he eh, works out. I don't care and, about and, him. Yeah, and he right. comes up and has has a has a you know a, a Jake Patricka like run of of you know a year and a half of being okay in the bullpen or a Matt Foster like run. I'm okay with that too. Frankly, the only thing that that makes it worth holding on to Mike Soroka is if the next time he comes out of the bullpen, all of a sudden it's like Michael Kopech. The velocity is up around three digits. The breaking stuff is that much better, and he is absolutely making guys look ridiculous because he could do Fine. it in a short stint if that happens then i will come on this show and say they were right to hold on to mike soroka even though if even if that happens though but if that happens though what are they really getting for him and it's not gonna happen but what would they really get for him like i mean that's the thing like it's it's as if it's the weirdest thing and we didn't get into it on the show and it's something i want to get into and maybe i'm going to bring james fox here i've actually been telling him like come on over here the guy from future Sox, but like come and sit at the bar with us right like let's do it we've got the video set up now i want to start doing some video shows so maybe very soon we'll get him in here because i want to go over this whole idea of people saying maybe we should trade Luis robert jr maybe we should trade garrett crochet even though we got control of him for two years i i don't i don't get that one at all no okay because if you continue to trade players away then you'll never have a team. What you're trying to tell me then is that you need to continue to trade, 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 and hope that somehow you come up with a 26-man roster of all fully controllable guys for a couple of years because because you're never going to pay anyone. And I get the idea that Jerry Reinsdorf's a miser. I'm the first one to say it. But you're going to have about $40 million on the books next year after you do the buyouts. And with a $100 million payroll, just raising this payroll a little bit or even coming back at the $80 million that you're currently at or whatever it is, 85 or whatever it is, I could make this team a winner with just going out and buying a couple of bats and bringing the young arms that are up here. You don't need to go into a three-year rebuild. You don't need to be just empty with tumbleweeds rolling through the ballpark for the next couple of years. You don't need to be that. And so I'm very concerned about the stuff that's come out over the last week or so where people are starting to suggest that the White Sox are open for business on everybody. You know, it's going to be very, very hard to continue to do this show when I hate the team. Like, that's what's, it's going to make me hate them. It's going to make me hate them, Ed. Like, I'm going to hate them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get up every day and say, I hate this team. Like, if that's what they decide they want to do, if they really want to trade off everything here and go back down the bare bones again, and I'm supposed to believe that a guy with no general manager experience whatsoever who hasn't shown me anything and didn't come through on what his promise was at the beginning of the year, because if they do that, he lied to us. Okay, Chris gets lied to us if they go and they do that. Okay, and I'm supposed to believe in that and invest in that? No, I'm just on Jerry Reinsdorf death watch at that point, like they were with Bill Wirtz for all those years. And then everybody will come back with brand new jerseys. But there'll be no names <laughs> on them because they're going to trade whoever it is immediately. Yeah. Right, uh, but, uh, but that, 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 be like, that's what you'd be waiting for. You would reach Bill Wirtzian type levels with the Blackhawks where everybody just left. And then, and then, like, they, like Blackhawk fans just returned out of nowhere after the, everything changed. And they're like, where did all these people come from? Because they just give it up on the team. Like that, so I, I don't believe it. Fox seems to think that they may actually be open for business. I want to debate them on the show. So we're, we're going to get to that. But I, I, I look at this team and I see all these things. It's like they want to make a piece out of everybody. I don't think you can trade every player. I really don't think you're going to do that. And so I don't know where you're going to get value in Mike Soroka now that makes it so important for you to wait on seeing something that's down in the minors that might be ready to go or that you could at least start to get around your major league staff so you can build them up and turn them into the next Garrett Crochet or piece that actually is going to be around for the next four to five years. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. 
Socks in the Basement. Socks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.